I'm Devin Taylor, and I'm a historian for the village of Mayville and the town of Chautauqua. I've been a New York State Municipal Historian for 29 years, and cemeteries are interesting. Not only are they the final resting place of many people, but are also repositories of history and outdoor sculpture museums that are open to the public. We'll take a look at some of the monuments and their decorations, find out a bit about various types of stones, and look at the history behind some famous and not so famous people that populate the cemetery. There are over 3,000 people located here with a growing population. Land for the Mayville Cemetery was donated by William Peacock in 1867. The cemetery itself is much older, with the first burial being listed on July 4, 1812, as Henry Windsor, aged six months. There are two entrances to the cemetery, one on East Chautauqua Street, where we are now, and one on Honeyset Road. We'll go through the old part of the cemetery first on our way to the Peacock Cemetery at the corner of the two roads. There are soldiers from all wars buried here, including the Revolutionary War of 1776. We have eight Revolutionary War soldiers buried here. Uh, they moved here at a later date. The first settler in Mayville and on Lake Chautauqua was Alexander McIntyre in 1804, and Mayville did not exist yet. Right by the cemetery entrance is the Revolutionary War soldier George Edmonds. Uh, over here, it's one of several stones facing away from the entrance. This is the older part of the cemetery, and the stones run at a diagonal to the stones in most of the rest of the cemetery. Many of the people in this part of the cemetery are only listed from readings taken down and published over time by several interested parties. Over this way is William Parment, who came here from England with his wife, Sarah Thomas Parment. Her stone has been broken in recent years. His name was William, and the last name was spelled so that it would be pronounced as Pamet. On his application to become a citizen of the United States, February 10, 1841 which is on file in the county courthouse. He had married his wife in Staplehurst, Kent, England, which is best known for Charles Dickens being involved in a train derailment accident. Peter Barnhart, a Revolutionary War soldier who came here from Pennsylvania, had an inn near Hartfield, which was where the men who participated in the Holland Land Company riot of February 6, 1836 met. The riot involved William Peacock as land company agent, and we'll talk about how it came about when we reach the Peacock Cemetery. The old cemetery used to be enclosed by an iron fence that ran alongside the road. It was considered to be in dangerous condition in 1957, and the village made an agreement with a man from Westfield that he would take down the fence, leaving the corner post and planting hedge in exchange for the value of the iron fence. This did not happen, so James Dudley, superintendent of public works for the village, removed the fence in the summer of 1966. Foundations for the post are still in the ground and can be seen near the corridor of East Chautauqua and Honeyset. Behind me, you can see on this side, two what are called table stones and a Greek temple style memorial. And then beyond that, two more table stones. All were carved by the Nixon brothers of Westfield, who were famous stone carvers at that time. Also behind it, you can see a spiky uh, monument that we'll be going to next afterwards. William Peacock first came here as surveyor for the Holland Land Company between 1798 and 1800. The Seneca gave up their claim on the land to Robert Morris in the Big Tree Treaty on September 15, 1797. Uh, they kept only small amounts of land for themselves to live on. New York had the right to govern the land, and Massachusetts had the right to sell it. Morris purchased the land and then sold it to a syndicate of six banking houses in, known as the Holland Land Company. They put up a building for their local land agent, William Peacock, and he moved in in 1810. Life was not easy for settlers. After purchasing land with a small down payment, 
they would have to build a log cabin, clear land, and buy supplies. These purchases were made on credit, and settlers paid off their debts by selling black salts. These were made by burning hardwood trees. The ashes were leached with water to obtain lye. The lye was then boiled, boiled in a kettle until it became black salt. Black salts were sold to an ashery, hence the name Asheville. That's, uh, uh, there was an ashery there, which converted the salts to potash. The settlers could also make money by selling softwood lumber, which could be made into rafts and floated as far as Pittsburgh. At first, the Holland Land Company made it easy to buy land, but Jacob Otto took over from Joseph Ellicott in Batavia and was stricter in demanding payment. There was also the matter of the road tax. Settlers could usually not afford to pay it and had to provide their labor on the roads instead. In 1835, the Holland Land Company sold all its assets in Chautauqua County to Trumbull, Carey, and George Lay. They raised the price on all land with payment overdue and said they would sell it if payments were not made. People were highly upset by the time a group of between 200 and 500 men gathered at Barnhart's Inn. It was generally known that this meeting was convened for the purpose of tearing down the land office and private residence of William Peacock. When they arrived at the land office uptown in Mayville, a light was burning inside, but no one was there. The door was broken down and the window smashed along with all the furniture. The stone vault, which can be seen uptown, was broken into and many of the records removed, taken to Hartfield and burned. Peacock was saved by his friend Donald McKenzie, who lived on the top of the hill where the former Mayville Central School, now the town of Chautauqua, was located. The land company office was moved to Westfield and a new brick mansion was built to replace the original Peacock Hall. Near the Peacock Monuments is the tall Howell Monument. Owners William T. Howell, along with J.H. Howell, J. Birdsall, A. Wilcox, built the ill-fated steamboat, and it was a sidewheeler steamboat, Chautauqua, in Mayville in 1863. It was 120 feet long and had a beam of 17 feet. Regular trips began May 17, 1863. Connections were made with the Atlantic and Great Western Railroad in Jamestown and the Smith line of stagecoaches in Mayville. James M. Murray took over as captain and part owner in 1866. And during the years 1867 to 1870, many improvements were made, including new engines and a new boiler in 1871. On August 14, 1871, the steamer left the Jamestown dock at 4 p.m. at Whitney's Bay, just below Prendergast Point. It docked there and started taking on wood for the boiler. After about 10 minutes, the boiler exploded, destroying most of the Chautauqua. Eight persons were killed and 12 seriously injured. The verdict of the coroner and jury was that Murray be indicted for criminal neglect because the boiler was defective in both material and construction, that the cause of explosion was too little water and too much steam, and that an unexperienced engineer was operating it. On December 1st, Murray was indicted for manslaughter. On May 14th, 1874, the indictment was dismissed. Near the old cemetery is the grave of Albert Brightman, who was the last soldier to come home from World War I in Chautauqua County. He kept a daily diary from the day before he left home, February 22, 1918, until the day he left to return home, March 17, 1920. The day that changed the war for him was Friday, August 23rd in 1918. They started for, for Vassel in France before daylight, but had to hold off until broad daylight came. As they were crawling along, he was shot in the leg at 3 p.m. He had to bind up the wound as best he could and laid there alone until 10 p.m. when, quote from his diary, Clark Johnson Hayden came with a stretcher and took me to first aid, remained in cave all night, doctor did it up some. He ended up in a ward, quarantine, 
where several people died from the Spanish influenza. He was sent back stateside on the small steamboat Henderson, arriving on January 5, 1919. He ended up having many x-rays and operations to move bits of dead bone from his leg at Fort McHenry, Maryland, but finally recovered. Albert never married and was an employee of the Chautauqua Institution Post Office for 30 years, and he never received a Purple Heart for being wounded in action. The Davenport Memorial Stone is not far from the Brightman Memorial. Ira's ashes are buried on the left-hand side of the stone where I'm standing. Brothers Ira and William Davenport started performing tricks about 1850 and later toured the world as spiritualists. They were born in Buffalo, New York to Ira Davenport, the father, and his wife, Virtue Honeyset. Her father and other relatives lived at Mayville in what was then Chautauqua County, so that the brothers' grandparents were Honeysets who lived on Honeyset Roads. The two brothers were familiar with Mayville and even performed a trick in traveling from Buffalo to Mayville faster than could be done at the time. They performed what were called dark seances in a darkened room tied up inside their spirit cabinet while instruments played to the crowds from the cabinet. William died in Australia in 1877 while on tour and was buried there. Harry Houdini visited William's monument there and decided to locate Ira, visit him, and learn how they did some of their tricks. Houdini came to Ira's house on Blanchard Street in Mayville in 1910 and learned how they made the spirit cabinet work. He wrote about it in his 1924 book, A Magician Among the Spirits. Houdini was not a believer in spiritualism and wrote that Ira said he and William never claimed spiritualistic powers or to be mediums. Ira did, however, continue to give readings at Lilydale, where some of their materials are located. Houdini had planned on visiting Ira again the next year, but Ira died July 8, 1911. Robert J.I. Cooper was a well-known Lake Chautauqua steam, steamboat builder who lived on Pratt Street in Mayville. He built his boats a uh, little down lake from what's now Lakeside Park. 23 steamboats were built in Mayville, and he built several of them, including the Josie Bell, the Mystery, the G.J. Cornell, the J.H. Lytell, and the Mabel. He died in 1901. Memorial Day, <coughs> or decoration, as it was called when it was first celebrated in 1868. Uh, this memorial monument is on the north side of the Honeyset Road entrance, and the first Veterans Memorial Circle was given by former Civil War soldiers. The E.F. Carpenter G.A.R. Post 308 donated it in 1890. Post 308 was granted its charter October 30th 1882. Their last meeting records were kept in 1913 and the post itself was gone after 1915. Former post commander Herman Sixby continued with the 112th Company E reunions until the last one was held in his home in Mayville in 1920. His Civil War sword is in the museum at the Mayville Ra Railroad Depot. Just behind the Civil War Memorial is a stone shaped like a tree stump. This came in several versions, was made of composite material, and was once a popular choice of monument. They are found in quite a few cemeteries, but never in any large amount. A little further west along the road, we come to the large mon monument to Albion Tourget, who was a Civil War soldier, teacher, judge, and an incredibly famous author. Albion was born May 2nd, 1838, on a farm in Williamsfield, Ashtabula County, Ohio. He attended the Kingsville Academy in Ohio and then entered the University of Rochester in 1859 and stayed there until January 1861 when he ran out of funds. He then became an associate principal of a school at Wilson, Niagara County, New York. In April, he enlisted in the 27th New York Volunteers for the U.S. Civil War 
and fought in the Battle of Bull Run, where he received a wound in his spine on July 4, 1861. It was an injury that would cause him pain for the rest of his life. Granted an honorable discharge, he was sent to his home in Ashtabula, Ohio. He then developed an interest in the law and studied it every day from August 1861 to July 1862. In June 1862, he received a bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester and in July received a commission as first lieutenant in Company G of the 105th Ohio Volunteers, withdrawing from the Army on January 1, 1864. On October 14, 1865, he and his wife moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. Torje became a writer and editor, but his position on the rights of blacks was unpopular in the South. On March 21, 1868, he was elected a judge of the Superior Court, 7th Judicial District of North Carolina, and served for six years. His book, A Fool's Errand, about Reconstruction after the Civil War was published on November 15, 1879. This was the book that thrust him into the eye of national politics and helped make him famous. In 1881, he moved to Mayville and bought his house, Thorheim, on South Erie Street, next to the library that is now there. His wife and daughter helped establish the Tuesday Club where they discussed books and started the first library in Mayville. One of his books involving the local area was Buttons Inn, published in 1887. The inn itself was a popular halfway stop between Mayville and Westfield and is featured in the legends of Lost Gold in Chautauqua Creek. In 1896, Torje and rented represented a black man named Plessy before the Supreme Court. Torje, on April 13, 1896, presented a legal brief based on the 13th Amendment prohibiting slavery and under the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of rights, that Plessy's rights had been violated. On May 18, 1896, the court, in a landmark decision, upheld the constitutionality of segregated facilities, separate but equal, was used to suppress minority rights for many years afterwards. Torget's prominence got him appointed as consul to Bordeaux, France on May 6, 1897. He and his family sailed to France on July 3rd. He died in France on May 21, 1905. His ashes were returned to Mayville and his monument was dedicated in 1906. He was so famous that over a thousand people came here for the dedication ceremonies. Uh, next, headed west, we come to Potter's Field. This is an area where the poor and indigent could be buried, and there are very few monuments or markers indicating those interred. It was a common feature found in many older cemeteries. There are two burials here that stand out. One was Jim Cook, and his stone is back behind me on the left who was a retired railroad employee. He lived in a tar paper shack on the lake below Lakeview Avenue and was well known locally. He was tall, wild-eyed, and wore a bowler hat. He would do things like pick berries and knock on people's doors trying to sell them. He liked to drink and on December 2nd, 1955, laid down alongside the railroad track on his way home from the bars on Water Street and froze to death. Second is Oscar Williams, who died on July 4, 1913, performing his Slide for Life act for a crowd of onlookers in the park beside the jail. He had a wire strung from the courthouse roof to an apple tree in an orchard just below the jail. Things went wrong, he hit the tree full speed, and his body was flung into the watching crowd. Newspapers of the time reported that his body was buried here but it is not in the official records. Paul and Marie Schofield Nelson bought the old A.J. Swartz store in Hartfield in 1946 after a fire had gutted the second story and it stood empty for five years. They put on a new roof and fixed it up into Nelson's grocery store. They ran the store six days a week until 10 p.m. for years. 
Paul was also a long-term supervisor for the town of Chautauqua before we changed to the present form of government. He was also a Boy Scout leader. Marie Schofield's family had run a sawmill, cheese box, and butter tub business in Hartfield. She said the name of Hartfield had come from the combination of family names of two early settler families, the Barnharts and Schofields. They retired and closed the store on December 16, 1973. We're at the third and newest Veterans Memorial and Burial Site in the Mayville Cemetery. Uh, this monument was donated by Gene DeMambro, a local man who made very good for himself. And from here, we will be heading south back towards the beginning uh, and the East Chautauqua Street entrance. Donald Mackenzie was born June 16, 1783 in Scotland near Inverness. His father was killed in a duel in 1789, which was the same year his cousin, Sir Alexander Mackenzie, discovered the river in Canada, which now bears his name. Donald left home for Canada March 18, 1801 at age 17 and was employed by the Northwest Fur Company for eight years. In 1810, John Jacob Astor organized the Pacific Fur Company and Donald was recruited by him and given five shares in the company. Donald then headed an expedition to the West Coast, which was the start of his vast knowledge of the Northwest. By 1816, Mackenzie was back at work for the Northwest Fur Company, which was taken over by the Hudson's Bay Company in 1821. He went to work for them as chief factor, establishing a new trading post. He was later transferred to Fort Gary in the Red River Settlement and appointed governor of the Red River Colony and remained there until 1833. On tour, Donald reached Lake Superior where he met Douglas Houghton, a geologist from Chautauqua County who described the beauties of the Chautauqua region and the relationship of its water tributaries to the early history of North America. He chose Mayville and Lake Chautauqua as the place he wanted to retire to. He built his house on top of the hill where Mayville Central School used to be. Mackenzie was great friends with William Peacock and when the Holland Land Company riot broke out in 1836, he took Peacock and many of his papers up to his house to protect them from the crowd. When the U.S. border with Canada was being established in the Northwest, Daniel Webster came secretly to his house to consult him in his knowledge of the area. Donald made frequent trips to Buffalo on horseback. On one of these trips, he was thrown from his horse at 18 Mile Creek and was seriously injured. He never recovered and died on January 20th, 1851, after livering on for six months and was buried in the family burial plot behind his house, which was on the top of School Hill. His widow, Adelgand, or Adelgandi, lived until May 6, 1882. Her will, dated April 9, 1879, left four and a quarter acres of property to the village of Mayville next to the existing cemetery along with $2,000 to improve and maintain it. She wanted to be buried without ostentation by the side of my deceased husband and that a large family lot be set apart in said cemetery containing the graves of myself and my husband in which my children and their descendants may be buried and that the remainder of said cemetery may be used as a village cemetery under control and management of said trustees forever. Mackenzie's house was demolished in 1969 during the last expansion of Mayville Central School. This iron fence surrounding a family burial plot is the last iron fence left in the cemetery. Uh, you can see it's not in very good condition, much like the one that was uh, removed along the front of the cemetery in 1966. The final stop is the Legion lot, which is the second veterans memorial area in the cemetery. Uh, there are a lot of World War II veterans buried here, and there are just a couple of other things that we're going to look at that are very nearby, very close to the East Chautauqua Street entrance. I'm standing next to the memorial stone of James Baldwin Burroughs, 
a Civil War soldier who is not buried here. Uh, it came from the Burroughs Family Cemetery that was located behind Jackson Park on Jackson Street in Mayville. The cemetery there was vandalized uh, several times and the remaining stones were buried face down under the guidance of John Lundsman in an effort to preserve them. The concrete block building here, people often wonder what it was or what it is. Uh, it was a shelter house built in 1931 based on a plan prepared by Merle D. Dennis. So people could wait here uh, if they were coming from a distance or they needed to use restrooms or anything like that.